When I was growing up, probably in the 60s, the biggest selling newspaper of the lot was a Sunday. It was called the News of the World, recently defunct because of scandal, funnily enough. Um, and the News of the World's diet was basically the shagging vicar. Um, you know, it would be a story about some posh bloke who was doing something he shouldn't, often garnered out of divorce courses or other sources of scandal. And it was massively devoured and loved by the great British public. My nan, preeminent among them, who would sit reading the news as well on a Sunday morning and go, oh, that's terrible. Oh, oh, loving every minute of every juicy detail. And 1962-1963 was a golden age of juicy detail. We need to think about here the arrival of the popular press. It wasn't just the news of the world, daily, it's like the Express, the Mirror. Often before, they'd still been pretty deferential to their elders and their betters. Not really so much anymore. That air of, oh, we must be nice to them, gone. And they're starting to get their teeth into them. And let's face it, what do we Brits love above all else? A good scandal. So what do we need for a good scandal? Well, we need sex. Absolutely. Even better if there's a bit of homosexual sex involved, especially in an age when homosexuality was illegal and most people were rabidly homophobic. All the better. Then we need class, because we're British and we're obsessed by it. Perhaps a bit of espionage, a bit of spying. And, well, let's have some more sex just to make sure it's juicy enough, shall we? So we're going to do four scandals to broke in 62, 63, and they give us everything we would want. Number one, the Vassal Affair. John Vassal, Monmouth School, by the way, but no university, war intervened into that, was a naval attaché. Just after the war, he was in Moscow, and he was pretty lonely in Moscow, partly because he was a bit of aloof and like the old figure, but also because he was homosexual in an age where homosexuality was illegal in Britain, as it was, incidentally, in the Soviet Union. He ends up moving in sort of you know, illegal homosexual circles in Moscow and gets invited to a party, and it's a Russian party, so of course he gets absolutely horrendously drunk, and it's a honey trap. He's then photographed in compromising positions with a series of young men, and those photographs are used to blackmail him. He worked for the Admiralty back in London, and for the next, basically, what, 14 years or so, passed secrets on from London to his handlers, which then passed them on to Moscow. Game, game was up, really, by 1961, when a Soviet defector named him, and there were things to worry about anyway. The unexplained income, posh West End flat, foreign holidays, when he only earned 750 quid a year as a civil servant. And the upshot was, in 62, he was arrested, confessed, and was sentenced to 18 years imprisonment. That would, that's the, would have been just a spy scandal, were it not for a much bigger one. Back in the day, the Cambridge spies had been students at Cambridge, as you can probably guess. Um, you can probably guess um, the schools, but have a go. Burgess, Eaton, McLean, Greshams, Philby, Westminster, Blunt, Marlborough, i.e. all public school boys, all Cambridge students. They were fashionably Marxist in an age before the Second World War, where Marxism was fashionable in Cambridge and flamboyantly homosexual. This was often a stage young men went through at the major universities. Sometimes it stuck for life, sometimes it didn't. Um, in this case, all of them were recruited, first of all, for the British Secret Service or the Foreign Office, MI5, MI6 Foreign Office. And they were also recruited by Soviet intelligence. And over the years that followed, all of them were selling secrets to Moscow, left, right and centre. In 1951, about to be blown, Burgess and McLean fled to Moscow. By 1955, accusations that one of their friends and another, in this case just about to be former civil servant, um, Kim Philby, by the way also British intelligence, was a Soviet spy were mounting. After a probably a pretty cursory investigation, hey, one of the chaps, you can't be a spy. Macmillan had got up as Minister of Defence in 1955 and said, no, nope, Mr. Philby is absolutely sound. So it didn't look that great, but in 1963, whilst at the, in the Lebanon, Kim Philby got on board a Soviet freighter, rounded, rocked up in Moscow, and, yep, guess what? He'd been a Soviet spy all along. He's the famous third man. Famously, the fourth man was Anthony Blunt, Sir Anthony Blunt, leading art historian, later 
keeper of the Queen's pictures. You know, so it's the great spy story of the lot. They were establishment men. They had betrayed their country and they hadn't been fingered nearly quickly enough because they were one of the chaps. What about some homosexual sex? I've got about some time for some robustly heterosexual sex. Well, this is called the Headless Man Case. In 1963, the Duke of Argyll sued his wife for divorce on the grounds of adultery. This was hardly difficult because the Duchess of Argyll was famous, shall we say, for being liberal with her favours with a series of young gentlemen. Now, in these days, divorce was a godsend to the press for a start. It means you didn't have to go anywhere apart from the High Court and just sit and watch and write it down. But what it meant is all the juicy details would be revealed and you could then report them because you're reporting court details. You're not being salacious. Oh, absolutely not. And of course, this was a golden one. It features proper aristos. It features alleged famous names. It features alleged two cabinet ministers, unnamed. We know who one of them was, by the way. One of them was definitely Duncan Sand, spelt Sandys who was Churchill's son-in-law, Eaton and Oxford, of course, and a former Minister of Defence and, at this point, Colonial Secretary. He definitely had an affair with her. But as the court details come out with this big list of men, by the way, a photograph is produced as evidence in court, and the photograph shows the Duchess without clothing, apart from her set of pearls, of course, because she's a Duchess, um, on her knees performing a well-known and popular sexual act upon a naked man. The photograph of the naked man stops at the neck. We can't see his head, hence it becomes known as the Headless Man. Well, of course, the nation was a gog. Who was the Headless Man? Was it Duncan Sands? No, it wasn't. We still don't know. Some people say Douglas Fairbanks Jr., some people not. We just don't know. The judge, summing up, noted her, quote, disgusting sexual practices. Lord Denning, the Chief Justice, was actually ordered to find the identity. Failed. A nation loved it. What a great story. What a duchess. Ah, yes. And then there was, of course, Profumo. John Profumo, Harrow and Oxford, um, was a rising star of politics. It's a bit dodgy because he was actually an Italian noble by birth. And he was Secretary of State for War. Meanwhile, Stephen Ward was a high society osteopath and panderer, as we call it. I, a man who specialised in finding attractive young ladies and supplying them for jolly evenings, mostly at Clifton House, um, the home of the Astors, in which um, Ward had a small grace and favour cottage nearby. Um, two of these were two young ladies, Christine Keeler, just 19 years old at the time, and her friend Mandy Rice Davis. Christine Keeler, proper Essex girl, both of them working class lasses, up for a good time. Meanwhile, at Clifton, the Astors were having a party, and Christine... Did what you do, took her kit off and swam naked in the Astor's swimming pool when the Minister for War happened upon her, as they say. John Profumo saw her there and boy meets girl, or in this case, girl meets middle-aged old bloke, but he's a middle-aged powerful old bloke and they have an affair. At the same time, she was also sleeping with Ivgani Ivanov who was a Soviet trade attaché, you can spell that, by the way, S-P-Y, i.e. with a Soviet spy. She was also having a series of affairs with a series of young West Indian gentlemen, one of them named Lucky, and when that led to a court case, the details began to slip out, and the Daily Mirror in particular got their teeth into the story. Trying to forestall a damaging scandal, um, Profumer made a personal statement to the House in which he denied any impropriety. Of course, he was lying through his teeth, and when the lies came out, he was forced to resign. What followed was a nasty establishment cover-up. Stephen Ward was put on trial, basically for living off immoral earnings, i.e. for supplying prostitutes. They were not prostitutes. And when about to be found guilty, committed suicide. Keeler and Rice Davis were both convicted for perjury in an entirely unrelated court case, but the conviction and the sentence, one suspects, were not unrelated at all. Meanwhile, though, nation lapped it up. Private Eye summed it up really well. They just got going by this stage. Um, you remember the great Macmillan quotation? You've never had it so good, Private Eye. You've never had it so often. Or, life's better under the Conservatives. Life's better under a Conservative. 
and mud sticks and mud stuck. The supposed betters, the establishments, the chaps, the gilded few born to rule, turned out to be the gilded few born to have affairs with 19-year-old Essex girls, born to spy and betray their country, and born to be in unfortunate photographs. The shine, I think, really was coming off the chance.